All right, we're on. Um, okay, there's some water down here. And I guess uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you guys again. Uh, my name is Yen, and I'm a principal engineer at a company called The Zone. So for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a streaming platform for sports, both uh, live sports as well as sports on demand. Anything that's happened in the last 14 days, you can go and watch it. We are very much like Netflix in that case, in terms of being a platform that is affordable and that you can, this sounds really weird, uh, it's affordable and you can watch a lot of different sports on our platform. Right now, we're only available in five different countries and not in the UK because of licensing and the uh, image rights. You can go into engineering.thezone.com to find out what we're doing and also the open positions that we have. And you can also follow The Zone Engineers on Twitter to see what the team is doing as well. So I'm here to talk about chaos engineering. And so I want to start with, a, I guess, a positive note about what happened with smallpox, which for a very long time was a deadly disease that we ever encountered as a species until about 1798. And uh, Edward Jenner created, developed the first vaccination. And over 200 years later, we were able to eradicate the smallpox at a global scale, which is quite a human achievement. Today, we have vaccination for something like 25 different diseases. And in the UK, by the time you're 14, you have been vaccinated against 20 different uh, infectious de uh, diseases. And vaccination has become our most effective weapon against infectious diseases. And it works by injecting you with a small sample of the disease. In, not enough to hurt you really badly, but enough to trigger your immune system to react to them, to identify it, and start building a defense against this disease before you actually come into full contact. And that's where you can find a lot of parallels with the principles of chaos engineering, as I'll talk about more later, which is a discipline in software engineering, whereby we inject, we, we run controlled experiments to test your system against the, known, against the failure mode by injecting small amounts of failures into the system deliberately. Not enough to hopefully bring down the whole system, but enough to, to test your system to uh, resilience against those failure modes. And if your system does have a weakness against those failure modes, then great. Now you have time to actually fix those problems before you come into full contact with those failures in production, where it's likely to manifest like wildfire. So chaos engineering is about uh, building resilience uh, by, ex by experimentation, by, um, by testing. So when I see people post, uh, you know, uh, write articles about chaos engineering and the titles like this, where you want to break things on purpose, it worries me a little bit because um, a lot of emphasis is, is placed on breaking things. And it's for someone who's new to chaos engineering and coming to this whole space, it's easy for me to conflate the action of what I do with the payback. Because the goal here is not to actually break production. Instead, it's about using experiments to uncover unknown unknowns in our system in how it fails under certain uh, conditions so that we can identify those weaknesses earlier and then start to build defense against them. And over time, by repeating these experiments, we can build confidence that our system will actually survive those failure modes should they ever happen in production. So the point is not to break things, however funny it may actually sound. Imagine if the medical professional has conflated the action of injecting you with some disease with the actual payback, <laughs> then uh, the whole point of vaccination could have been very different. Uh, so imagine someone comes to you and goes, uh, now I'm going to inject you with some smallpox. <laughs> That's not what we actually want. And if you go to principleofchaos.org, you find this very nice documentation around what this discipline is about and how you can start doing chaos experiments yourself with four simple steps. Step one being you want to define what the normal state looks like. This is uh, where you see things is working as you expect. But if everything's on fire all the time, then I'm afraid you don't have a steady state and you're not ready to start doing chaos experiments. In the same way that you wouldn't want to vaccinate someone if you know, if you know their immune system is only shot a bit. So even injecting a small amount of, uh, of, of disease is going to really hurt them. And once you have your steady state, you know what normal work working condition looks like, now you can start to hypothesize what should happen when some failures start to happen. So, and you want to, if you want to run experiments in production, you should know that you need to be quite confident that your system can actually handle those failure modes before you actually try to run those experiments. Typically, you want to start doing experiments in a, uh, in a say, a staging environment where the cost of accidentally, accidentally breaking things is not quite as severe. <laughs> 
Of course, you should still try to run those scenarios where you just have no idea what's going to happen. And they are great for uncovering unknown unknowns and identifying weaknesses very early on, but you shouldn't try to start them in production right away. And for any experiment that graduates to production, they need to be carefully considered and carefully planned. And you, like I said before, you should have a very good confidence that you're not actually going to break the system in production. And you, you get that confidence by repeating those experiments in an environment where you can more safely and uh, comfortably break things like in a staging environment. And by repeating those experiments, you start to build confidence that once you graduate those experiments to production, things should, be, should still be fine. Because the goal of vaccination is not to actually catch a disease. So similarly, the goal for chaos engineering is not to actually break your production environment. If you know something is going to break and you do it anyway, then I'm afraid you're not, for starters, you're not learning anything new that you didn't know beforehand, but also you're just being irresponsible and breaking things for the sake of it. And you're going to hurt your user experience and you know, chances are may, many of the users may not even come back. So now you know you, you can handle it and you want to start planning this chaos experiment, how do you actually do it? The most well-known tool is uh, uh, Netflix is the Simian Army, which consists of a number of different tools inside that. And the Netflix guys uh, even did a really good job in the publishing a free e-paper that you can download from the O'Reilly website, where you can read about, I guess, the social side of things. How do you communicate what you're doing? How do you plan? How do you execute? And then get into the culture of running experiments. And one of the Netflix engineers uh, who was uh, responsible for introducing um, chaos engineering to the company, he since then started his own company called the Gremlin, where they publish a commercial tool for you to start scheduling, planning, and executing those chaos experiments in your own organization. So once you run your experiment, now you want to go back and uh, look at the data to try to prove or disprove your original hypothesis in terms of what should your system, how your, your system should behave under those failure conditions. And if you, were to, if you were able to find evidence that your steady state was impacted by the failure that you were injecting, then great, you've uncovered a weakness that you may not know about before, and now you have the time to actually go and build defense against that weaknesses so that by the time something does happen in production, you know you're well protected. So again, chaos engineering is about using controlled experiments to help us learn about how a system actually behaves under different failure modes so that we can build confidence in its ability to withstand those conditions over time. The point is not to actually hurt production. So that means when we run these experiments, we need to make sure they are actually under control. How many times have we seen in sci-fi movies where a well-intended experiment just goes out of control and then now we have the zombie apocalypse? So to do that, the first thing you want to make sure that is everything you're doing is very well communicated. If your experiment is going to impact the model team, make sure that they are aware of what you're doing and also they are ready and okay for you to actually do those experiments that's going to impact their system. It's never okay to spring this as a surprise to someone. So if I come into the office and realize that all my dashboards are red, it shouldn't be the case that it's because some other team, because you, is running, you are experimenting experiment that are impacting my system without telling me first. Another thing in terms of how you plan and execute those experiments is around timing. You definitely want to make sure that you, when you run those experiments, you do it in, inside the, during office hours when people are, are in the office and they can deal with any unexpected fallouts. And if you've got some big launch days coming up, for example, if you're Netflix and you're launching a new TV series, you don't want to go anywhere near those launch days with your experiments. I mean, there's a time for taking risks and learn for the sake of learning. There's also a time to just you know, take, be reasonable and, and apply common sense and just pray to God that everything goes well without having to complicate things. And finally, containment and blast radius should be front and center of your thinking. And this is especially true if you are planning to run experiments in production. Because again, the point is not to hurt production. So you want to do the smallest change possible. That's enough to give you enough data to identify whether or not your steady state was impacted. And at the same time, you want to make sure that you've got a rollback plan in ready so that should anything goes wrong, anything unexpected goes wrong, then quickly apply the rollback to stop the experiment right away. So you hear all these big companies that are the Netflix and Amazon and Google and Microsoft in the world running these experiments constantly in production. But it's worth remembering that even those guys, they didn't start in production right away. 
there's a lot of learning that happens in environments outside of that in order to build confidence before they can actually be confident that a system can withstand the kind of failures they're going to inject. There's a lot of things you can learn by just running experiments inside a dev or in a staging environment. That gets you used to the, I guess the, the chores of planning, running experiments, collecting data, and then proving or disproving your hypothesis. And chaos engineering is not just about stress testing your infrastructure. Russ Miles, uh, who runs the, I guess, the consultancy firm called the Chaos IQ, he has talked about in the past how chaos engineering can actually be applied to all layers of the social technical system that we use to do software development. And he's, uh, he's, he's, he's very knowledgeable about chaos engineering, and he has talked at length about the, sort of the human side of things, the social side of things, in terms of how you communicate both upwards and downwards in terms of what you're doing. And one of the things, one of the most important lessons I learned from him is uh, when you go to the business, guys, uh, don't even call it chaos. The moment you call it chaos, he will start to get you know, tissues and uncomfortable. Call it what it is, which is continuous resilience testing. <laughs> <laughs> and when you phrase it in those terms, it's a lot more acceptable for, uh, for, at least for people who are, doesn't understand what it is you're actually doing to accept, no, okay, right, this is what you guys are doing, great. <laughs> And in terms of the tools that we talked about, the Simian Army tools earlier, where you've got latency monkey that can introduce arbitrary delays to your APIs, and you've got chaos monkey that can randomly queue a server, you've got chaos gorilla that can knock out an entire availability zone, and then you've got chaos con that can just queue an entire AWS region. <laughs> And then you also have uh, tools I've seen attempts at uh, basically allowing you to run Chaos Monkey logic inside a Lambda function. But having been working with Lambda and serverless technology for a while now, what I'm really interested in personally is how can we apply some of those uh, learnings, some of those principles to a serverless technology, to a serverless application, whereby the server is no longer something that you can access and therefore there's nothing for you to kill from the infrastructure layer. But then again, Chaos engineering is not about killing servers. It's one of the things that we do in order to apply those principles when our applications are running primarily on virtual machines. Chaos engineering is about identifying weaknesses before they manifest in system-wide aberrant behaviors. And we shouldn't confuse the principle with the action that we, uh, that we do in order to apply those principles. And having worked on a non-trivial server application in one of my previous jobs where I migrated a social network stop from running on monolithic system to pretty much running entirely on serverless, one of the things I learned is that with, when you go to serverless, you have way more inherent chaos and complexity in your system. Sure, we have much smaller unit of deployment, which is a great thing for many, many reasons, but at the same time, we ended up with a lot more of them in terms of the number of deployment units that we have to think about. And it also means that it's now a lot harder for you to harden around the boundary of those individual deployment units because you have to think about all, instead of having two services, you now you've got to think about the bound, hardening the boundary around, say, 10, 20, maybe even 30 different Lambda functions. Every single one of them, you have to think about timeouts and configuration, permissions, security, and so on and so forth. And for people like me who are building systems with serverless technologies, we just want to use as many managed services as possible because apart from just uh, getting away from having to worry about compute and the servers, we want to move away from the competency of that comes with having to manage and configure and, um, and uh, provision your servers. And that means we're now using a lot of intermediate services between Lambda functions and uh, just in general as well. And every single function, every single managed service that we use has got its own set of failure modes. Some of them are documented, which is great, but I'm pretty sure that most of which are not even documented, or maybe even known to the developers of those services. And if, even for those uh, documented failure behaviors, there's no way for us to really verify how their system is going to behave under those failure modes until it actually happens. And then you have to think about configuration. Now you have a lot more things you need to configure around the timeout, around permissions, and uh, so on and so forth. And then there's the, all the things that a platform does for you from scheduling container to scaling to, say, pulling kinesis and then calling your function with batch of records. Every single feature that we get from the platform has got its own set of failures mo modes as well. And since we don't control those, uh, those um, infrastructure, that means that we don't really have a way to, understand, to really understand how they fail 
under how they behave under certain failure modes. And for example, if something does happen to Lambda, and now all of a sudden the Lambda function is not able to get, uh, receive records from Kinesis uh, for you to start uh, to process those uh, records in, in real time, there's nothing really I can do to fix that. I can't provide a meaningful alternative to run my workload on, say, a virtual machine or on a container because the state of the polar is not in my control. I, I can't just say, okay, I've got five shards that are pulling from Kinesis and processing things, and when Lambda has a problem, I just move that workload to something else. I can't really do that. Instead, my, I'm left to just have to wait for Amazon to fix the problem. But even with that said, there's still a lot of weaknesses in our own code that we can identify and, and um, uncover with uh, controlled experiments. For example, maybe when we are communicating with a downstream system, we are not handling timeout cases in a graceful manner, or maybe we are not dealing, we have a missing error handling in our code, and in cases where we can use a fallback when one of our downstream systems is, is uh, having an outage, we are maybe missing those as well. And one of the most common things that I run into in production is tend to be performance or latency related, and they can be symptomatic of a whole host of different issues under the hood, which could be Amazon having a networking issue, or I could be talking to a server that's overloaded, or I just managed to hit a server that's experiencing a long garbage collection pause. So how can I do this with experiments uh, to test my system's resilience against those failure modes? I start by defining what normal looks like in my system, which of course means that I have to look at, I have to decide what metrics I should monitor, which of course depends on the type of application you're building. But some common good candidates include uh, your 95 or 99 percent percentile latency, number of errors, as well as the number of requests that you were actually able to process. And once I know what normal should look like, now I can start to hypothesize about how a system should behave. And there's a couple of things that we need to understand about serverless application as well, which is different. For example, with uh, API Gateway, now we've got extra complexity in that uh, API Gateway has got a hard limit, a hard timeout for two, of 29 seconds. So even though my Lambda function can run for five minutes, API Gateway is going to stop listening. It's got a timeout after 29 seconds. So if I'm doing anything longer than 29 seconds, then I need to worry about that as well. And then there's also the effect of cold starts. If I've got one function behind API Gateway talking to another one via API, via HTTP, then the, even if I know the other function has got a timeout of two seconds because I configured it to be that, the actual latency I can experience can still be a lot higher because by the time you take into account cold start as well as any latency overhead that the API Gateway layer introduces, that I can quite easily see a latency that's higher than two seconds. So that's where you need to start. So, and a, a, rule, a, a rule of thumb in microservices is to use very short timeouts when you're talking to other services. And the goal of that timeout strategy should give, you, give your HTTP request the best chance to succeed whilst without running the, the risk of causing your function to timeout as well. And this is where I find that when you're trying to use, you're trying to come up with a fix, the timeout value is quite tricky. You can be, oftentimes you find them they're too short so that you are not giving your request the best chance to succeed. And sometimes they can also be too long so a slow response from a downstream system can cause your function to time out and therefore cause your, can start to cause a cascade failures up the call chain as well. And this gets a lot more complicated when you are making multiple API calls, which is quite common nowadays when you think, consider that an API would quite easily make a call to get some data, manipulate the data, and then make another call to save the data, to save the changes. And two common approaches I've seen, both have got their own shortcomings. Uh, one, suppose you've got your function that's got six second timeout, and I know I'm making three API calls. So I'm going to divide that six seconds equally between three so that uh, every single request have got timeout two seconds. And in this case, even if I actually have enough time to do all three requests, but because one of them is slower than two seconds, I end up causing it, I end up calling the uh, time out, timing out the call, so the request is not given the best chance to succeed. Another approach I see quite a lot is uh, I've got a function that's got six second timeout, so I'm going to give every single request five seconds, so that uh, even if every single one of the requests is not particularly long, but together they are still longer than my six seconds for my function, so my function ends up timing out when the, collectively the API calls I'm making are slower than usual. 
So instead, what I propose is that we should try to adjust the timeout we use for those HTTP requests based on the actual amount of invocation time we have got left, which fortunately is actually available and we can get it quite easily through the context, which is one of the arguments that your function is invoked with. So in this case, the scheme would be I always leave a little bit of time at the end so that I can do some recovery step should something fails, but otherwise, Every single request is given as much time as is left in the current invocation. And uh, if somehow that's still not enough and uh, we have a timeout, then now I've got some time at the end that I have reserved to do some recovery steps, which could be including making sure that you log uh, the timeout incident with as much context as possible. For example, uh, what was the timeout value you used? Uh, what was the URL you're trying to talk to? Any correlation IDs you've collected so far, as well as maybe the request object they used to make the calls as well. And you also want to make sure that you report those as the custom metrics. So for example, service X dot timeout. So now you can start to aggregate those uh, timeout incidents and in cases where you can use a fallback instead, then you should also try to do that as well. And that is actually a pattern that's baked into the Hysterix library from Netflix, whereby suppose you're trying to do a read from DynamoDB, that times out, and if you got a previously cached value for this request, you can return that instead. Or if failing that, you may even be able to return some default value. And that's exactly what happens when you go to Netflix homepage, where they try to load your, uh, use, your, use, your personal profile to give you recommendations, including stuff that you should continue to watch. Uh, and yes, I was watching Benji about uh, Black Lightning and Deadpool. <laughs> surprisingly, interest, uh, surprisingly enjoyable, Benji. Um, <laughs> I'm a sucker for animal films. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> where was that? Right, so when you go to, <laughs> so when you go to Netflix, if uh, that user profile API for some reason fails or timeout, then instead of just you know, blanking it out, I'll give you, oh, 500, I'm sorry, what Netflix will do is uh, they try to return a previously cache value or response for your profile if it's available. If it's not available, then you kind of get back the default uh, profile for anybody who's just joined Netflix. So if you, see, if you go to Netflix one day and see that you don't see Benji here anymore, it means that you, maybe one of those courses failed. And that's a very common trade-off from uh, for uh, of uh, precision for availability. But in cases, uh, it's not always the right choice. For example, if someone wants to go to the banks, uh, uh, the, the, the banking website and try to check their balance, maybe you don't want to return a default value of zero or even a stale value of the yesterday's balance. Um, in this case, it might be actually better to say, sorry, we're not available, please come back later. Otherwise, the next thing someone's going to do when they see that is that they're going to call the bank and find out what the heck is going on. So even though this trade-off for of, um, uh, precision for availability is a really good one and quite common for people to take, uh, you do have to consider the, user, the impact on user experience. So let's talk about how we're actually then going to inject some failure. Suppose you've got a setup here where you've got two user-facing APIs, both with API Gateway and Lambda, both talking to some internal API, also with API Gateway and Lambda. And the hypothesis, the hypothesis is that the, our user-facing APIs have got appropriate hand, uh, timeout when it for those communication and is able to handle and, uh, errors and degrade gracefully. So what you can do in this case, uh, you can inject latency into the HTTP client that you use to talk to other services. In this case, that allows you to validate that the function itself is handling slow responses from its uh, dependencies. And we should do the same thing as well for AWS services that we speak to via AWS DK. And we can apply the same, uh, same idea to inject latency into AWS DK uh, uh, clients that we use to talk to, say, DynamoDB and so on, so that we know what happens if, uh, say, DynamoDB one day has a really bad day and they start to have uh, five second latency instead of what we typically see in terms of uh, single digit milliseconds. And so what's the blast radius for this particular experiment then? Well, since it's going to impact just that particular function at the edge, you're not going to cause a cascade failure. You are going to have an impact on the client, of course. But what if we want to expand this hypothesis to understand that does all of our user-facing API, does all of our user-facing APIs that talk to this internal API, are they all handling timeouts or slow responses properly? Then we can also inject latency into the function directly 
In which case, you're gonna you're gonna start to impact all the functions that talk well, all the functions that talk to that particular internal API. So now you've got a pretty big blast radius, and you can actually start to cause cascade failures in the whole system. So as we talked about earlier, it's, uh, it's quite risky, and uh, you don't want to break production. So while this type of experiment is quite good at very quickly read out any weaknesses that you have in terms of timeout handling, it's not something that you should go to production with, but instead you can try to do that in a staging environment. And the reason for running that, uh, for running this type of experiment, at least for me, is that I think we often miss the trick in that we are not priming our developers to think about failures during the development phase. By and large, when you're building a new system, you're working against a dev environment that's got minimum load, so you never run into performance or latency related issue because everything is just running at 3% CPU, so everything is super fast all the time. And the moment you release your things into production, now that's a whole different ball game altogether. You can't control how your users behave, they're all gonna come in at exactly the same time, and the old service is gonna get overloaded, and you're gonna see all kinds of behaviors that you never see in a during the development. And there's a technique in psychology called priming, whereby we can subtly manipulate the way someone thinks and behaves by repeatedly subject them to the same set of stimuli. So Facebook, as they were trying to enter the, I guess, the developing countries uh, where the networking is not so good, so what they do is they run what they call the 2G Tuesdays, whereby every Tuesday they would change the office Wi-Fi to be like 2G so that all the developers have to experience what using Facebook in 2G feels like. So having that constant exposure forces you to start developing your application with those uh, um, users in mind who is not using Facebook on a Wi-Fi or 4G. So the kind of experiments like this can actually be quite useful to run constantly in, say, your dev environment, whereby you do you inject this kind of latency or this kind of failures for a small percentage of requests, maybe 1%, maybe 3%, consistently. So always your developer is gonna experience some kind of error, some kind of failure, some kind of slow response so that they have to constantly think about, oh right, that API can actually be slow sometimes. And that can be useful in terms of building up the, I guess the, the, the human side of things to, to make sure that your developers are constantly thinking about resilience. And of course, the client is also an important part of, this, uh, of, of the overall resilience of your system. So you can again either inject latency to those uh, user facing the, um, the edge services to the functions, and then you can validate your client application is handling timeout and handling slow responses. And those experiments, because it's only touching edge services, so you're not likely to cause cascade failure, so they're really relatively self-contained. But you don't have to touch your functions either, you can also do the same thing to apply the, to inject latency into the HTTP client library that your client application uses instead. So now you are watching the monitors, you're making sure that everything is, is, uh, is fine, you're looking at those key performance, uh, key performance uh, metrics, and after the experiment, you go through the, the metrics and look for evidence that your steady state was actually impacted by the, by, the, uh, by the failures that you're injecting. So how do we actually then go and go ahead and inject latency to our course? If you're using, say, a static language like uh, Java or .NET, you can use a Weaver like AspectJ or PostSharp. And uh, for dynamic languages like Node.js, you can also create the wrapper libraries. So what I did in this particular experiment is that I created a custom HTTP library that has got a single method that allows me to inject some latency based on configuration so that I can control when, those uh, when we should start inject latency and then uh, what sort of percentage, uh, well, how, many, what, how often and when I do that. And actually, as some delay, I just use bloopers uh, promise.delay to add some small delay based on configuration. And in my custom HTTP client, I've just got one method really to make an HTTP call and based on the configuration, I can decide when and when and how much latency to add. And in this case, my configuration is all stored in SSM parameter store. And when I run the experiment, I want to actually see some latency being injected, so I dial the probability all the way up to 50% of the time uh, with a delay between 100 and 5,000 milliseconds. And uh, since I hooked up everything with x-ray, so when I run the experiment, I can actually see that in this particular case, uh, there's no latency being injected, so everything was still fast, 59 milliseconds. But on a separate run, 
I can see that I was in, uh, actually introduced, uh, I injected uh, 3.4 seconds of delay. So that's all well and good for a single method with, with a custom HTTP client. You can't really feasibly do that for the AWS DK uh, where you have so many different clients, you can't just create a wrapper for every single one of them. So what you could do instead is try to apply the same technique as uh, say, Bluebird's uh, promise file or. In this case, I've got a badly named method called the injectable or, which uh, takes the HTTP client, uh, sorry, uh, AWS DK client that's already been promisified, and I override the uh, async functions and to take in another configuration object like the one we saw earlier. So now when I talk to DynamoDB with this configuration, I can see that occasionally I can add, I add some latency to that, that communication to, you know, in order to test what happened to my function when DynamoDB is being slow. And all the code that I use for that for those experiments you can use available online, so you can go to GitHub and play around with that. But we don't have to stop there either. We can also inject other forms of uh, errors. For example, if you want to see, you can inject if it uh, for HTTP communications, you can inject uh, 400, you can inject the 500 as well. And also, you can also start to experiment with uh, with scenarios where, for example, if um, your function is throttled, and that's one unknown that many of us don't know how our system is going to behave when Lambda has got concurrent execution limits, a soft limit for 1,000 by default. So what happens if one of the critical functions gets throttled? You can start to run this experiment by just going to one of the functions and change the concurrency setting for that particular function to force it to get throttled. And then you can start to see what actually happens to the rest of the system when that starts to happen. And if you want to see what happens if, my fun if a DynamoDB is having a really bad day and no one can talk to you at all, then you can also start to change, play around with the IEM permissions for individual functions that you want to target to say, okay, now this function can't talk to DynamoDB. Now you can start to simulate those failure modes and see is my function is uh, able to handle those kind of errors, those kind of failure modes, uh, should they ever happen? I guess the takeaway here is that you have to accept that failures are inevitable. Just like we have to write our tests against the business logic and whatnot, we have to test our code against resilience as well. And the way to do that is through controlled experiments. And through these experiments, we can learn about how our system actually behaves under failure mode so that we can, over time, build confidence and improve the resilience of our system. And that means, well, unless, of course, you just jump the gun and uh, start to go straight into production and start breaking things for fun. And then uh, once that happens and you get caught by the business, then uh, you can be sure that no one's ever going to let you go anywhere near production with your fancy chaos experiments or continuous resilience testing ever again. So don't do that. <laughs> And with Lambda, we have in, we have Lambda, with Lambda, we've got some interesting new challenges in terms of how we do these kind of experiments because we can no longer control or access infrastructure. So a lot of the experiments we have to do focuses around the application layer. We have a few things that we could do around infrastructure, like the things I talked about in terms of configuring and um, concurrency control in order to simulate what happens to your function when it gets throttled. But with all this uncertainty, we all got this uh, inherent chaos. There's more need for us to. To, to think about failure, to think about resilience, and start to protect our system by vaccinating it against failure modes. So my name is Yen, and uh, I'm hiring at a zone, so feel free to come talk to me <laughs> about joining us. Uh, you can find me in all these usual places, and I also have got a uh, video course with Manning around uh, how to do, um, I guess, DevOps with serverless, uh, how to build logging, monitoring, observability into your serverless application, and so on. And you can also get a 40% off with that code whilst we are still in MEEP. Um, so that's, that's everything I've got. Oops. So yeah, thank you.